Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are taking a look at a really cool little pinfire revolver. This is a model of 1868 Gendarmerie pistol, specifically as adopted by the Vatican, by the Pope, the Papal States, in 1868. Now a little bit of a quick recap on what the heck are the Papal States. This was the territory that came under the direct control of the Pope and the Vatican Authority, which in the early half of the 1800s was a pretty substantial area. This was one of many independent states in the Italian peninsula. They had a land territory approximately the same size as Switzerland in the first half of the 1800s. So really a not insignificant force in geopolitics at that point. Now with Italian unification everyone came together in a new kingdom of Italy except the Papal States. Now they lost a lot of their territory in that process, but didn't actually cease to exist, well, until after this revolver was adopted. We'll talk about what happened to the Papal States later in the video. But uh, the point being here that this was a, a, an independent state that required an armed police force for internal security, that was the Papal Gendarmerie, and they needed guns. So they had adopted the model of 1858 Le Fachot pinfire revolvers, but for the Gendarmerie those guns were kind of big and bulky. Those were 12 millimeter pistols, so think of that as a little over 45 caliber. And they were intended as military pistols, not policemen's pistols. And so they were too big, too heavy. And in 1867 the uh, papacy went looking for a new pistol to add to the armament for its gendarmerie, and they wanted something a little bit lighter and handier. So they actually tested a Chamelot Delvin pistol in 9mm pinfire. Now Chamelot Delvin is best known as uh, you know, things like the French 1873 and 1874, the Italians also, well, <laughs> the Kingdom of Italy would adopt a Chamelot Delvin in the 1870s as well. They're best known as center fire double action pistols, revolvers, but the early Chamelot Delvin pistols actually included single action guns, included uh, pinfire designs as well. And so with the, after having tested this pinfire 9mm Chamelot, the decision was made that like, the thing's good, the cartridge is good, the cartridge is powerful enough, it's a, a compromise, a reduced power compromise that they're willing to take in order to have a smaller handier pistol, but the gun itself was still too big. And so the, the Vatican wanted something that was a little smaller and handier. Well that's where we get to the Mazzocchi brothers. These are three brothers, Piero, Giuseppe, and uh, Luigi, who were actually the third generation in this family to be the official armorers to the Vatican. Uh, interestingly until 1850 apparently their workshop was in Castel Sant'Angelo, which is an old Roman tomb, which is kind of, that's kind of cool. At any rate, by this point in the 1860s they were doing quite a lot of work. They actually built both uh, French pattern tabatier rifles and also Remington rolling blocks for the papacy. And they had a workshop of between 60 and 85 workers, so not an insignificant endeavor. They were based in Rome still at this point, and they presented this revolver uh, for consideration for the new Gendarmerie contract. So let's take a quick look at it. It really is a nice, handy, sleek, elegant looking uh, revolver. It's also actually fairly small. To put it in context, here's a French 1874 Chamblot Delvin to compare to our Mazzocchi. Also important to point out that they decided to use a single action system with in fact a sheath trigger. So this is reminiscent of like some of the very early Smith and Wesson revolvers, very much reminiscent of a like a civilian pocket model revolver rather than an official you know, the, the gun of an official armed force like a gendarmerie. But it certainly does make the gun a little bit lighter, makes the holsters a little bit smaller because there's no trigger guard involved. Uh, not the sort of thing you would be carrying, uh, carrying around cocked, that's for certain. We've got serial numbers all over this thing. You can see three of them right there, number 1291, so right out of the middle of production. These are not parts interchangeable guns, uh, they were all made by hand, and uh, if you want to swap parts out they do have to be hand fitted, hence the profusion of serial numbers. And we have one little tiny mark down here on the side of the trigger, and that is the Mazzocchi Brothers Rome. Function wise, this single six shot, there is a safety notch on the hammer, and then full cock, and then you can 
drop it down, there is a loading gate here which lifts up, which is a bit unusual. This is actually one of the elements that is reminiscent of the very early Chamelot Delvin revolvers. Um, you can see this feature in some of their patents, the, the loading gate lifting up like that. We then have six chambers of course, these are pretty heavily tapered chambers, 9mm you have the little notch here for the pins. The hammer is actually slightly offset so that you can still use the sights, like so, just barely though. You can just barely line up the sights uh, with the hammer cocked because it's offset, but it still has a central impact on, uh, on the pin. Speaking of the sights, they're both fixed on the barrel itself, so very simple, not particularly precise or good sights. And then in case one of your cartridges gets stuck, we have an ejector rod doubling as a lanyard ring in the butt of the pistol. I have to say I am not, I have, I've been trying to figure out why the front of this is threaded. It doesn't screw into anything in here as you'll see in a moment. Um, I'm sure there's a really pretty obvious explanation and it really kind of annoys me that I haven't figured out what it is, but uh, this does function very nicely as your ejector rod should you need such a thing. All right, let's go ahead and take this apart. I'm going to start with the grips. There's just one screw that runs through both grip panels. So by the way, this is where that rod uh, is stored. So you can see it doesn't screw into anything up there. On the other side we have our V-spring, nice cutout for the spring on the inside of the grip panel. Next up we have a side plate held in place by two screws. With the screws removed, that side plate just lifts right off. And, you can, and with that removed you can see we have even more serial numbers. Basically every major part is serialized. We have a V-spring here to provide force to the hammer. Now let's go ahead and take the barrel off. There is one screw on the bottom. Once we take this screw out, we can actually then just unscrew the barrel. So this is a feature that is very much off the Lufachot revolvers. This is not a Chamelot Delvin sort of feature. Uh, once that's out we can then pull out the cylinder. And then interestingly we can actually just unscrew the cylinder axis pin and it comes off like so. Normally V-springs in guns like this can be a huge pain to take out and really a huge pain to get back in, but this one is actually not that bad. So we'll drop the hammer all the way and I can just lift this up. Note that it has a little pin on it here and there's a little locking hole. So when I need to reassemble this I can hook it onto the hammer there and then I can just squeeze that into the trigger and then slide it down until that pin drops into the hole. It's actually a pretty easy V-spring to, to reassemble. Now I'm going to go ahead and take the hammer out, just pull out that pin, and the hammer is going to come out with a couple of other pieces. And then what the heck, let's take the trigger out as well. With the screw removed, the trigger is just going to slide right out the front there. All right, the last two bits in here are the loading gate and then this L-shaped thing is actually the spring that puts tension on the loading gate to keep it in the upward or downward position. I'm going to leave all those pieces in place. What I do want to point out here is if we look at the front of the, the frame, we have a slot here and that's where the hand is going to push up each time you cock the hammer. That that hand pushes on these notches to rotate the cylinder, and it's interesting to point out that the, this particular revolver rotates counterclockwise, which is the opposite of what's normally done. Then we also have a little hole right there. That is for this pin. When the hammer is cocked this pin pushes through that little hole, and these tabs on the cylinder, well the cylinder then runs into that pin with these little tabs, and that's the cylinder stop. We're used to seeing a cylinder stop that actually comes up uh, through the trigger guard and locks the cylinder in place out here. 
In fact, on a later Shumlo Delvine, you can see that cylinder stop right there. And you can recognize that it's in the gun by looking for the stops on the cylinder, which are right here. Compare that to our Mazoki cylinder, which does not have stops like that, it instead has little tabs. This is something that appears to have been on some of the very early Shumlo Delvine patents, but it is also uh, a feature of the Le Fachot revolvers. Now, the gendarmerie had Le Fachot revolvers before this was adopted, certainly the uh, Mazoki brothers were familiar with them, and while this is generally described as a Shumlo Delvine copy, it bears as much ele as many elements of the Le Fachot as it does Shumlo Delvine, um, perhaps more Le Fachot. Shumlos are probably best known for their complicated double action triggers, and this has a very simple single action trigger, something that in this case the gendarmerie specifically really wanted. So there is our entire uh, model of 1868 gendarmerie revolver disassembled. In February of 1868 the Mazoki revolver was formally adopted for the gendarmerie. They were given a contract to manufacture 2,500 of these, which is actually quite a lot, um, with deliveries 40 per week uh, at a cost of 56 papal lira per gun. And I have absolutely no idea what the papal lira in 1868 converts to in today's money. But it was certainly a nice contract for the brothers to keep them in business for a solid year. That's, by the way, 60-some weeks of production, assuming they don't lose any to quality control. So uh, it appears that all of the guns were in fact delivered. Uh, examples of these are fairly scarce, but they show up across the whole serial range from the lowest. I've seen ones with three digit serial numbers, um, and there are ones documented up into like the 2300s. So the whole, the whole run was delivered, they were issued, they were used by the, the papal gendarmes. But not for very long, because in 1870 the Papal States would effectively cease to exist. They had been, their sovereignty had been maintained by a French garrison in the city protecting the Pope and protecting Rome, but the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 uh, caused Napoleon III to pull that garrison out of Rome to assist with some of the fighting a little bit closer to home. Once the garrison was gone, uh, the unified Italian Kingdom went to uh, take possession of Rome, the Vatican defenders put up basically a token fight, just enough to be like, yeah, we didn't just hand it over, like you had to take it, but there was absolutely no question of what the outcome was going to be. And so in September of 1870 uh, the official Papal States ceased to exist, and in fact the Vatican would sort of exist in a weird diplomatic limbo until 1929 when Vatican City was formally established by treaty, the Vatican City that uh, is still seen and recognized today. So anyway, uh, very cool to get a chance to take a look at one of the Papal Gendarmerie revolvers. This is in fact the only pinfire revolver model that was manufactured in Italy in, in completeness. There were uh, Le Fichot revolvers that were put together, but most of that stuff uh, was done with parts brought in from Belgium. These were manufactured from scratch all the way through to completion in Rome by the Mazzocchi brothers. Oh. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.